Call this hearing to order. Every day when Americans sit down to order goods from a website or consume media online, we are participating in a vibrant digital economy, an economy that takes the ideas and creations of artists, manufacturers, and innovators and puts them within reach of our couches and our kitchens. Digital trade means supply chain tracking, 3D printing, or digital platforms that lead to e-commerce, e cloud computing, and social media. You know the names of the leaders in each of these areas, Facebook, Amazon, eBay, and so on. That's because the United States has pioneered this digital revolution. What many don't realize is that trade in manufacturing goods is, its, is itself a part of the digital economy. From the websites that market the goods to the payments processing systems that carry out the transaction, the digital economy facilitates the movement of all kinds of consumer project products from warehouses to family homes. American manufacturing relies on e-commerce and digital trade. The benefits of digital trade include domestic economic growth as well as spreading American ideas and culture across the world. Of course, to us, this is good. Yet there are others who consider the free flow of information, products, and ideas a threat to their control. And nearly three decades after the Berlin Wall fell, the way ideas and goods travel from one nation to another remains a contentious issue both politically and legally. In fact, because of the novelty of digitization, commercial principles and freedoms that were carefully developed for conventional trade and gained international consensus are now at risk of being circumvented. With every innovation comes opportunity for economic advancement, but also opportunity for some foreign governments to grow their own power. In today's interconnected economy, they can have wide-ranging effects on international commerce and other national economies, as well as the free flows of information. Digital technology does raise legitimate privacy and cybersecurity concerns, but some governments may not be sufficiently concerned with the effects of their policies on trade, and some may even be using these concerns as an excuse to be protectionist and for other purposes. Some foreign governments impose additional taxes and fees, and some governments will only permit sales on the condition of storing data locally or providing the source code that will inevitably be used for a competing state-backed product. Some governments that otherwise enforce property and contract laws turn a blind eye to or even facilitate intellectual property theft. This is especially true when the division between the state apparatus and the private sector is non-existent. Up on the screen right now, on the right, is a map of the world showing the prevalence of digital trade barriers. The lighter colored regions like Australia, Canada, and Mexico are perceived to have taken a light-handed approach to trade barriers. And at the other end of the spectrum are trading blocks in countries like the EU and China that make access to their markets far more difficultly and costly. In part, their motivation likely is to catch up to the United States, the leader in digital technology development, and try to take the lead themselves. American companies have always thrived in a competitive market, but the competition must be fair and free from foreign government intervention on behalf of their domestic companies. That is why global players with large economies, such as China and the European Union, which represents large global market shares, should see the rewards of developing their own digital economies without discriminatory standards and testing requirements, localization requirements, forced technology transfer transfers, and the like. Governments with control over market access should not use their leverage to extract concessions from companies in competition with one another. In the decades after World War II, U.S. companies dealt with smaller economies that saw the likely economic benefit of opening their marketplace, and their citizens benefited from more choice, lower prices, and faster economic growth. And we must be vigilant to preserve the principles that have already led to greater prosperity throughout the world in the digital trade arena. And that means addressing swiftly and clearly the excessive burdens foreign governments place on American digital products so that we are not unfairly disadvantaged and can compete on merits. That also means negotiating new agreements that protect not just America's economic interests, but allow the free exchange of culture and ideas throughout the world. The world is a better place thanks to American ideas and commerce. Keeping the global digital marketplace open means continuing the fight for that better world. And before I introduce our witnesses today, I will now yield to Representative Beyer for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Since this committee took up digital trade last fall, President Trump has waded into the trade issue in unpredictable and destabilizing ways. The President's erratic, aggressive approach is creating an environment of economic uncertainty, is alienating our trading partners and allies, and risks harming the global economy. 
So far, the President's trade advisors have seemed uninterested in the significant majority of the U.S. economy that this does not consist of heavy manufacturing. Not only has digital trade not been front and center, it seems the administration simply does not have a strategy for how to strengthen U.S. leadership in digital trade, nor any interest in creating one. Ceding ground to others, including competitors who are putting up new barriers, hurts our economy and our workers. This failure to lead is a missed opportunity for U.S. small businesses, technology companies, manufacturers, and farmers, and all who benefit from the increased export opportunities made possible by digital trade. It also risks the United States falling behind as other countries race to create the technology of the future and write rules for operating in the digital economy. Strengthening our position in digital trade starts right here at home by ensuring an open internet that enables innovation to flourish. flourish. To that end, it's critical that we restore network neutrality, which is vital for small business owners who rely on the internet to compete with bigger companies. It also means expanding access. Too many people still don't have access to a broadband connection. And their ability to compete in an increasingly digital economy is undermined with that high-speed internet. We need to keep our focus on creating opportunities for all Americans. As we hear this morning, the digital playing field around the globe is far from level. When dealing with China, American companies confront rampant theft of U.S. intellectual property, forced technology transfer policies, data localization requirements, and other efforts to tilt the playing field against the United States. Equally concerning, China is becoming a model for other countries who are erecting trade barriers that restrict the free flow of data. We need to knock down these barriers in a systematic, thoughtful way, rather than pursuing a policy of ill-conceived tariffs that create additional barriers to trade. Burdensome data regulations are particularly onerous for small and medium-sized firms that don't have big IT departments or can't absorb the added costs of having to store the data locally or comply with other requirements. Digital trade is just one piece of a broader trade landscape, and in the last few months, it's been harder and harder to understand the administration's position on a range of trade issues. One Wall Street analyst estimates that the administration's erratic trade policies have cut the value of U.S. equities by $1.25 trillion, and the costs extend far beyond the stock market. The administration's tariff on solar panels will cause the loss of thousands of jobs and the delay or cancellations of billions of dollars of investment in solar energy. These tariffs will slow our transition to renewable energy. The administration has used dubious national security justifications to levy counterproductive tariffs on our closest allies. The President has repeatedly acknowledged that these tariffs are not justified by national security concerns, undermining any future U.S. case of the WTO. By levy levying these tariffs, he's managed to damage our economy and our alliances in one fell swoop. And of course, the negative aspects of President Trump's trade policy are compounded by his dyspeptic approach to diplomacy, and nowhere was this clearer and his catastrophic performance at the G7 in Charleroi. Public expressions of disdain for our leaders of our democratic allies will only make them less likely to engage in productive trade negotiations. And as the president becomes increasingly unpopular abroad, it becomes difficult for democratic leaders to engage in new agreements with the United States. We need a trade policy that is guided by principle, not whim, that is forward-looking, not reactionary, something that we saw from previous administrations. But that's not why we're here today. The way President Trump has gone about renegotiating NAFTA has generated instabilities, fighting almost daily with Canada, as threats to leave the NAFTA deal risk disrupting markets, raising prices, and may trigger retaliatory tariffs. Rather than pursue productive discussions with China to drive changes in their trade practices, President Trump has launched a trade war, rolling out $50 billion in tariffs and threatening another $200 billion in tariffs last week. China, of course, immediately promised retaliatory tariffs of the same scale. Even the President's Council of Economic Advisors prepared an internal analysis showing that tariffs will harm our economy. You know, trade is often a ripe area for bipartisan agreement. It's often especially true in the area of digital trade. But the damage to trading relationships with the administration's moves to impose tariffs on steel, aluminum, and other products harms the United States' ability to forge partnerships that will expand trade, both online and offline. And that uncertainty is a chilling effect on trade of all kinds. We've only begun to see the damage from Trump's trade policies. I really look forward to hearing from the witnesses today how we can promote digital trade, how we can knock down barriers, and how the administration can play a more constructive role in expanding American trade. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And now with our four witnesses here today, we'll start with Mr. Sean Heather, who is the Vice President of the U.S. Chamber's Center for Global Regulatory Cooperation. 
He also serves as executive director for both international policy and antitrust policy. During his 15-year career at the chamber, he has worked on a number of diverse issues, such as international trade and investment, taxes, standards, technology, and corporate governance. Before joining the chamber, he worked for the Illinois Comptroller and with several political campaigns across the state. He holds an undergraduate degree and a master's of business administration from the University of Illinois. Mr. Ryan Redia is a research fellow and regulatory counsel at Competitive Enterprise Institute. His research encompasses intellectual property, information privacy, and cybersecurity. Mr. Radia has published extensively in, a major news, in major news outlets, appeared on dozens of national shows, and contributes to several blogs on policy and technology. Mr. Radia holds a Juris Doctor from the George Washington University Law School and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Northwestern University. Ms. Rachel Pfeffer is an analyst in international trade and finance at the Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Trade Division of the Congressional Research Service, where she focuses on digital trade and the World Trade Organization. Before joining the Congressional Research Service, Ms. Pfeffer worked at the Department of Commerce and the Food and Drug Administration on trade issues. Previously, she worked in the private sector for various tech companies in the private sector. Ms. Pfeffer holds a Master of Business and a Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy from Duke University. And also joining us is Ambassador Robert Holliman, is the President and CEO of Crowell and Morning International, as well as the partner in Crowell and Morning's International Trade Group. He served as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative between 2014 and 2017. And during this time, Ambassador Holliman was responsible for trade policy and services, investment, and intellectual property, and led the creation of the Digital Trade Working Group within the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. He received his Juris Doctor from the Louisiana State University Law School and a Bachelor of Arts from Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. And with that, we will welcome uh, and begin our testimony with you, Mr. Heather. You are recognized for your statement of five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member and members of the committee for inviting me to testify. In previous testimony to this committee, I highlighted how certain governments are unnecessarily restricting digital commerce and seeking to undermine American technological innovation. Restrictions on cross-border data flows via forced localization measures, new complex and burdensome regulatory regimes, problemsome custom approaches to e-commerce, and investment measures that force tech transfer are some of the most common digital challenges that American companies face in foreign markets. Advancing American interests in the global digital economy needs to be a top international priority, and we need a whole-of-government approach to counteract trade and regulatory barriers to digital goods and services. This starts by recognizing the importance of services. Without question, American manufacturing is a big part of the digital economy, whether simply sold through e-commerce channels or part of the growing number of products that make up the Internet of Things. However, we must not overlook our dominant position in services, and the Internet is making services more tradable every day. The United States is the world's largest exporter of services, and we enjoy trade surplus in services of nearly $250 billion. Moreover, services sales by foreign affiliates of U.S. multinational corporations tops $1.4 trillion. Despite these big numbers, the potential for services industries to engage in international trade is almost untapped. One in four U.S. factories export, but just one in every 20 providers of business services export. This means only 3% of U.S. services output is being exported. Therefore, our support for digital trade starts with increased support for our service industries. Now let me turn to the importance of the State Department and the Department of Commerce. Foreign embassies are the first line of defense against impediments to digital trade and are important messengers for a liberalized approach to the digital economy. The Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs at State plays a central role in coordinating U.S. engagement on ICT and cyber policy matters. Likewise, the Department of Commerce plays a critical role in advancing U.S. digital exports and advocating for the adoption of U.S.-friendly digital regulatory frameworks. It also has a core responsibility to safeguard the voluntary private sector approach to standards that underpins many ICT products. Since its inception in 2016, working with the State Department, the Commerce Department has operated a valuable digi digital attache program that embeds U.S. digital policy experts in key U.S. embassies. Expanding this program, ensuring adequate resources, and giving them a clear mandate to focus on digital trade is critical to ensuring American leadership in the digital economy. Further, State and Commerce should lead a whole of government effort to support international privacy and cybersecurity frameworks that facilitate the seamless movement of data across borders. We applaud the administration for its efforts last year to ensure the EU-US Privacy Shield successfully made it through its first annual review, and we look forward to supporting this review this year post Europe's implementation of GDPR. 
However, Privacy Shield is just one approach. The United States has importantly also advanced with an APEC, the cross-border privacy rules, to promote the movement of data between borders and bridge national privacy regimes. The United States should do more to encourage APEC governments to join. Further, it is important to develop similar mechanisms with other regions of the world, including Latin America. While differences between privacy regimes can be bridged increasingly, cybersecurity regulatory frameworks are being developed that also threaten the movement of data. The United States has created the NIST framework, an innovation-friendly framework to manage cyber risks. However, approaches developed in foreign jurisdictions often look much different. The United States needs to be more active in both shaping and aligning these emerging regulations, but, it's, but also developing new agreements to address cross-border cybersecurity requirements. Turning to trade agreements, the Chamber sees the need to seek commitments from our trading partners to support digital trade in goods and services and foster cross-border movement of data. We welcome USTR's efforts to modernize NAFTA to include digital trade provisions. We also strongly support the United States playing a leading role within the WTO to develop e-commerce rules that ensure an open and predictable marketplace for American businesses. We would also encourage the administration to consider relaunching negotiations around the Trade and Services Agreement, or otherwise known as TISA. TISA has the potential to be more than just a services agreement as it could secure data flow commitments to the benefit of all sectors. Finally, while USTR, Commerce, and State play focal roles in developing and advocating a U.S. digital strategy, U.S. regulators are very much needed for a whole government approach to be effective. The Federal Trade Commission has been active with the Department of Commerce to advance an understanding of U.S. privacy protections in shaping foreign privacy laws and in being the enforcement behind data flow agreements like Privacy Shield. But other U.S. regulators are increasingly being called upon. U.S. financial regulators need to be there to ensure regulatory frameworks abroad don't limit U.S. opportunities for fintech leadership. U.S. auto and aviation regulators also need to be there to encourage that regulatory designs abroad will not affect American competitiveness on things like automotive uh, autonomous vehicles and drones. Further, regulators in foreign markets are beginning to contemplate policy questions about artificial intelligence, machine-based decision-making, access to algorithms and big data, as well as a host of other issues. U.S. regulators need to be at the ready to positively shape these discussions. In whole, or in short, a whole-of-government approach requires the entire U.S. government to be vigilant, coordinated, better prepared to actively shape foreign regulatory environments that will deeply impact Americans' ability to compete abroad. With that, I thank you for the opportunity to testify and look forward to your questions. Thank you. And Mr. Radia, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Paulson, Representative Byer, members of the uh, committee. We're at a critical juncture for international trade. And at this time, the United States must maintain its historic role as a global leader and promote free trade and open markets. I'll focus specifically on the information economy. The U.S. technology sector is not just important domestically, but it exports uh, $300 billion annually in products and services, supporting 800,000 American jobs. Tariffs and non-tariff barriers to trade uh, do risk trade in the digital marketplace. I'll focus on another set of policies, however, that threaten digital trade governmental regulations regarding privacy, copyright, and antitrust. Particularly important is the European Union. Their member states collectively represent America's single largest trading partner in goods and services. And there are 430 million Europeans who use the internet, meaning that Facebook has more European users than American users. Google's more popular as a search engine in Europe than it is in the United States. The same is true for tech companies of all sizes. So although EU users are a core aspect of the user bases of United States technology companies, the European Union's approach to regulation differs dramatically from that in the United States, underscoring the need for greater U.S. leadership in this space. Uh, in particular, the European Union, as Mr. Heather mentioned, recently implemented the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. It went into force on May 25th, 2018, and in just over a month, it's already had major effects on how digital trade occurs between the United States and the European Union. Those effects, I believe, will only grow. Uh, the GDPR, it applies to any company that processes or controls data on EU data subjects, no matter where the company is domiciled, and in some cases, regardless of the size of that company. The GDPR does not distinguish between offline and online data collection, but the brunt of its impact will be felt and is being felt by technology companies and financial companies. So far, some of the most notable examples of the GDPR include U.S. companies stopping providing service to EU users for fear of regulatory fines, which in the EU can amount to up to 4% of a firm's global revenue. Tronc, formerly Tribune Online, has stopped serving EU users with websites like the Chicago Tribune and the Los Angeles Times. A&E Networks followed suit. 
uh, so, uh, an internet analytics firm called Clout that helps social media users and Thinkfluencers gauge their reach, shut down its operations entirely on May 25th, the day the GDPR went into force. Many other examples, not just in the United States, but around the world have occurred. Uh, the result of this is not just harmful to the EU users who will lose out on American content and American companies who will lose out on revenue from EU users. Even those who comply with the regulation will, will have a more difficult time monetizing their content. But also it hurts US consumers because in this industry where fixed costs are high and the marginal cost of delivering uh, content to consumers is low, any reduction in revenue from a major user base means a reduction in the quality of overall service. So the, the cost of compliance with the GDPR uh, will likely be significant, according to estimates from Ernst & Young and the International Association of Privacy Professionals. The average Fortune 500 company spent $16 million to comply with the GDPR in the two years before it went into effect. Uh, it seems that, that, that the cost of complying with this regulation will only increase. Uh, moreover, the GDPR may entrench existing internet companies at the expense of startups because large established companies that could not have complied with the GDPR when they were in a dorm room or a garage uh, are now better positioned to, to do so. The, the role of US leadership in this space is important. Congress has been considering a number of bills to address privacy. Uh, although I won't discuss the specifics of those bills, it's important that Congress and the administration take a lead in advocating an approach to user privacy and data protection that recognizes the need to, to reduce compliance costs, that respects the role of notice and choice, and that does not put onerous mandates on businesses. In brief, a couple of other areas in which EU policies are harming or potentially risking harming U.S. businesses include the European digital single markets, treatment of copyrighted materials. In general, the European Union's digital single market is a laudable effort to harmonize regulations and taxes across EU member states, but it has also uh, created and will continue to create barriers and restrictions on practices such as geo-blocking uh, and uh, different treatment of content by content owners in the movie industry, streaming platforms, and the like, ultimately hurting consumers. Similarly, the European Union's approach to competition policy has targeted US companies, record-breaking fines against companies such as Intel, Google, and Microsoft, several of which are still under appeal in the EU courts, have undermined American companies and represent a seeming effort by the EU to engage in protectionism. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rodia. And uh, Ms. Pfeffer, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Paulson, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My testimony focuses on the increase in digital trade barriers around the globe and how other countries are shaping new international standards and rules that may impact the ac market access for U.S. firms. The internet-driven digital revolution is causing fundamental changes to the U.S. and global economy. According to the U.S. International Trade Commission, in 2016, the digital economy supported 5.9 million U.S. jobs. The United States is a leader in international digital trade. U.S. firms Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and IBM are top global cloud service providers. At the same time, challenges exist that may impede the growth of digital trade. Multiple U.S. public and private sector reports identify a breadth of digital trade barriers including high tariffs, localization requirements, such as cross-border data flow limitations, intellectual property rights infringement, and forced technology transfer. Congress has taken an interest in addressing trade barriers. In 2015, Congress set negotiating objectives for trade agreements to include provisions, such as the World Trade Organization's non-discrimination provision to digital trade, and to prohibit forced localization requirements and data flow restrictions. The proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership included these provisions and others, and multiple opportunities exist to pursue these objectives in ongoing negotiations as highlighted in my written submission. No single set of international rules or disciplines governs digital trade. This lack of globally accepted rules and standards means that individual economies around the world are creating their own, experimenting with different approaches. I will focus on how China and the European Union, or EU, are each shaping global norms. China has a fundamentally distinct approach to the internet. 
with over 700 million internet users and the world's largest market for e-commerce, China is attractive for many U.S. businesses. However, China's various government policies and actions have limited the ability of U.S. firms to compete there. For example, China's policy of internet sovereignty censors or limits what websites or data individuals can access. China's cybersecurity law restricts cross-border data flows and requires safety reviews of critical network equipment. Many U.S. firms are concerned that this law may lock them out of the market or force them to transfer proprietary technology or information to Chinese regulators or partners. The EU poses a different type of challenge for U.S. firms. Its legal approach to information privacy and protection of personal data has led to policies that vary from those of the United States. As mentioned, the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, took effect last month. It establishes a single set of rules for personal data protection throughout the EU and grants individuals new rights to control their data. U.S. firms have voiced several concerns about the GDPR, including its complexity, how it is implemented and enforced, and the scale of potential fines. Some U.S. firms exited the EU market rather than comply with the regulation. Because no multilateral rules exist on cross-border data flows or data privacies, some experts state that the GDPR may effectively set new global data privacy standards. Countries such as Brazil, Japan, and South Korea consulted with the EU for their own data protection laws. Some U.S. firms determined it is easier to comply with EU regulations globally rather than implement changes only for the EU market. U.S. privacy advocates and others support these decisions. Some analysts view China and the EU as using their large market size to impose their views and set global rules. They contend that the United States should proactively counter their efforts. Others suggest that the United States should focus on developing new digital trade rules and disciplines through trade negotiations. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And now we'll hear from uh, Esther Honeywell. Halliman, apologies, apologies. Halliman, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Paulson, Mr. Byer, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. I have three points I'd like to make. First is that U.S. leadership in digital trade isn't about technology. It is, and it's not just about the technology industry. It, digital trade is the tool by which every business um, competes, whether you're a home enterprise or managing a supply chain or you're accessing a market. It's fundamental, and I share the view of your vice chairman, Senator Lee, from your earlier hearing where he said that we're swiftly approaching a point where the word digital will be an unnecessary adjective for trade. Digital underpins every aspect of our economy. And I think it's critical for us to recognize that, part of the digital transformation, because it also talks about why this issue in your hearing is imperative for U.S. industry and long-term leadership. I just returned from Hong Kong and Beijing, and I can tell you the fast pace at which foreign competitors to U.S technology leaders and U.S. companies who rely on technology are gaining ground quickly. And as one foreign um, government official said to me, he said, I'm not sure people in the U.S. fully realize how much in Asia that non-U.S. technology providers and platforms are gaining an edge over, in many cases, U.S. firms. Now, we're still the leaders, but the competitors are catching up very quickly. We've had discussions about the rules that foreign governments are setting up that um, impact this, and I will be happy to answer questions. I think our fellow panelists have discussed this well. One of the things that we did at USTR under the leadership of Ambassador Mike Froman was create a digital trade working group to try to bring the uh, entire USTR approach on focusing on this, not just the tech people, not just the people from one region, but we wanted essentially a SWAT team so that if we saw a digital trade barrier being erected, we could move quickly to try to address that. And one of the key factors that we did was ask the International Trade Commission to undertake a three-part study.
that looked at the impact of digital trade barriers. It's already been referenced. The first study came out last August. It was intended to really look at the scope of this. The next two studies are to look at B2B digital trade, the next to B2C business to consumer digital trade, and they're intended to be providing our negotiators in Congress with information about which aspects of this are the most impacted by regulations, which are sectors that are important now but long term will be part of the underpinning of American competitiveness and allow USTR and this Congress to help prioritize in fighting digital trade barriers. My second point is that we have to continue to lead. Um, and this is a practice you know, we focused on broad bipartisan support. I will say that not only is the administration's current approach on trade causing uncertainty within the business community, but it's also, in my view, crowding out the attention that should also be focused on digital trade. We need our allies working with us to break down these barriers. We need to flex our muscle to show on the trade landscape that we have a better approach to digital trade. Uh, there are several models I'm happy to talk about. Uh, the broadest model is now what we're not only trying to do in NAFTA, but what the 11, you know, the 10 trading partners are trying to do in the um, comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the model. Finally, I'll talk about a big opportunity, which is privacy. Uh, we've heard a lot, and I agree with the statements about how the European Union, with their comprehensive approach to privacy through the GDPR, which went into place last, last month, has really begun to set the global framework around approach to privacy. But there is an alternative, and it's actually an alternative that America helped endorse, which is the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum Cross-Border Privacy Rules. That's an approach that is the U.S. and 20 other economies of how you would transfer data around uh, the Asia-Pacific region. The U.S. has supported this. It is important for us, for this committee and others, to do everything possible for the U.S. to encourage our trading partners in APEC to stand up and put in place those cross-border privacy rules that has an Asia-Pacific and an America supported framework for privacy as a counterpoint to what the EU is doing. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but we should not take a backseat to any country in our leadership on these issues, and I appreciate the important role of this committee in shining a light on digital trade. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Halliman. Um, I will ask that members do keep their questions to five minutes, and I will begin. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. Heather. Um, the EU's general data protection law, GDPR, which several of you actually referenced in the notices we've been receiving about it here in the United States, are a wake-up call uh, that alerts us to the fact that foreign government actions in their own domestic markers can have a very direct <laughs> repercussion for us as well. Um, I've heard from folks in Minnesota, for instance, that have expressed confusion about the complexity and they're just questioning about where do they go next. Maybe, can you just frame a little bit more about, you know, for the committee here, what are the developments that are taking place in other countries or trading blocks around the world with respect to the governance of digital services and digital technology? Or maybe can you sketch out a little bit about, you talked a little bit about the program with the Department of State and the Department of Commerce, but for us here in the United States, our involvement in this process, how can we be making sure that our interests for our citizens and our businesses are in, in fact protected? There's a lot there. Uh, Chairman, to, to, to respond to. I think, first of all, what I would say is this, that uh, the primary concern around privacy regulations is the ability to move data. Uh, the secondary concern around privacy frameworks that we see around the world is the ability to offer the products and services that you have in that market. Uh, so whenever you're looking at a privacy framework, whether it be in the EU or now in about 190 different jurisdictions around the world that have updated their privacy laws or in the process of updating their privacy laws, uh, when we evaluate those, we evaluate them on that two-pronged test. Will this regime limit the ability to move data outside of the country? And two, how harmful will it be for us to offer the products and services uh, that we would like to offer uh, in that market? Uh, as I think has been uh, discussed here at length, uh, Europe is way ahead of the game in terms of influencing the world around GDPR. Uh, many of the governments around the world have looked to Europe as a model and have uh, taken most of it, not all of it, but most of it, uh, where I think uh, an effort should be made today um, is on cybersecurity. 
Uh, there is yet to be uh, the race for who des de defines how cybersecurity laws are written around the world. Uh, Vietnam just put a new law on the books recently that forced localization of data. Uh, and oftentimes, these cyber laws are a second bite at really privacy questions. Uh, here, I think the U.S. has a helpful message uh, in the NIST framework uh, that could be advanced uh, in these foreign markets with discussions uh, with legislators and regulators in those economies. Uh, and I think an effort to uh, do more on the cyber front uh, would be uh, imperative because I think that's the next battleground for data flows and questions of forced localization. Ambassador Holliman, let me just follow up because I think Mr. Heather mentioned TISA as an opportunity uh, in this space. And, and given your experience at USTR, maybe can you describe a little bit for the committee how TISA could be used to advance some of these, these concepts? Uh, my understanding is that the work that has been done on NAFTA, which obviously has not been concluded and modernized, has been very progressively very well in the area of digital space, used as the model out of TPP that you were involved in. But can you just elaborate maybe for us? Certainly, Mr. Chairman, I mean, the Trade and Services Agreement would be a big opportunity. We were working to negotiate that uh, in, in our administration. It's an opportunity to bring sort of new industries together around new frameworks. Candidly, the challenge around that is also going to be the EU. I mean, their views on, on data movement and protection uh, are very different from the U.S. I tend to think that we should look at a potential plurilateral agreement um, around data and around uh, the digital economy, and that we should actually align with the uh, TPP partners around the set of data issues, because their view on data, as they've now adopted, as we're promoting in NAFTA, is essentially the same. And so I actually think that would be a faster way for us to set rules on data than the TISA, which I also think is hugely important for a broader set of industries. And Mr. Redia, would you uh, concur in some of those comments? You mentioned that we should not mimic what uh, the EU is doing, for instance, in GDPR. I, I would concur with those comments that we should, we should stake out a role that emphasizes that customizable agreements between users and companies are important with respect to data localization. Ideally, when companies make decisions about where to store data about particular users, that decision should be made based on efficiency, based on how the technology works, on optimizing the user experience to the extent that harmonization can occur, that a multilateral agreements can occur that ensure that companies don't have an incentive to store data in one place about a user rather than another because they can be subject to a, a different set of laws. Uh, that would help uh, advance innovation and competitiveness. Thank you. Mr. Byer, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And thank you all very much for your testimonies. Mr. Heather, you're, Tom Donahue, your boss, president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, said this spring, quote, that tariffs of $30 billion a year would wipe out over a third of the savings American families received from the doubling of the standard deduction in the tax reform bill. I know the chamber is very clear in its opposition to tariffs. But last Friday, the Trump administration detailed $50 billion in tariffs against Chinese imports. What's going to be the impact on American consumers of this trade war? And aren't higher prices just a different way of, of essentially raising taxes on them? So I think the Chamber's uh, concerns with the approach that the Trump administration is taking, uh, both with regard to tariffs as well as uh, with regard to the approach in renegotiating NAFTA, is well documented in terms of, of the Chamber's uh, objections to the way this administration is headed. And yes, we do believe tariffs are taxes uh, on American consumers. Thank you very much. Ambassador Holliman, the, first of all, thank you very much for your services you. in the USTR. Uh, the administration is now fighting trade battles with Canada, with Mexico, with Germany, with the WTO, this cozying up to Russia and North Korea. Does the president's seemingly belligerent attitude towards our allies, our trusted trading partners, make it more difficult to reach agreement on digital trade issues? Well, we lose our focus through that. I mean, it's hard to prioritize those issues when you're attacking your allies, and that's why I believe we really have to find an approach on digital trade where we find some group, and quite frankly, that is not only our NAFTA partners, but that's our former TPP partners, and we need to create them as allies in this and get focused on those issues rather than, in many cases, treating them as enemies, uh, which is what we're doing certainly in the proposed auto taxes and the steel and aluminum taxes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Heather, the Administration in China, I know you're very aware they're going tit for tat on tariffs from everything from agricultural products, steel, electronic components, semiconductors, lithium batteries. 
Given the potential for tariffs on electronic components that are important to building out the digital infrastructure, can you talk about the potential consequences of the existing tariff battle on our ability to move forward on digital trade? Well, I'm not a tariff expert. I spend most of my life thinking about non-tariff barriers in the regulatory context. But as I uh, said before, tariffs are taxes on consumers, and so the cost uh, for consumers to access uh, digital technologies will inevitably go up. I assume you're, you're distraught, too, about the potential for 25 percent tariffs on all imported cars or banning all German luxury cars. I, I think our views on 232 are also well documented. We were not supportive of the approach on steel and aluminum. Uh, and our concerns associated with where they may be headed with 232 on autos is also on the record. Yeah. Ambassador Holliman, restrictions on the cross-border flow of data, the, the, the so-called data localization requirements, are, are immensely costly for U.S. businesses across a wide range of sectors. And, and countries seem to be imposing these requirements in a supposed effort to protect privacy, you know, the word about the NSA, improve cybersecurity, bolster economic growth. But it seems that the data localization effects have exactly the opposite effect. How can we most effectively, the U.S. government, U.S. businesses, push back against these? Well, two things. Uh, certainly the effort, uh, while I don't agree with the, all the tactics and tools, the effort to focus on the problems in China are critical. When I was there for a cyberspace trilateral with China, India, and U.S. think tanks two weeks ago, the Chinese very proudly talked about the concept of data sovereignty and why they needed to restrict the information that was coming in out, out of the internet, not only for their citizens, but for their businesses. Um, and we have to push back about against those. We do have a tool, we have a group of people, group of countries who share that view. Um, led by Japan, Canada, Mexico, we need to align with them because quite frankly, the Chinese approach is gaining support from other economies who look at that. We need a counterpoint. Um, secondly, we have to, promote things like the APEC cross-border privacy rules as a viable alternative, which it is, to the GDPR. The U.S. is behind that, Japan's behind it, but we need to get more countries, economies behind it and really drive it because that is part of the answer to ensuring that there is an American-led approach to privacy and cross-border data transfers. Great, thank you. Just very quickly, WTO for years has agreed no customs duties and electronic transmissions, and now Indonesia seems to be going in a different way. Is there anything specifically we can do to try to change Indonesia becoming the new role model? Well, um, one, I think we need to have a sort of plurilateral. Two, I think we have to complete NAFTA and show that we've got the cross-border rules there. And three, I think we have to use our bilateral tools with Indonesia to push back on this and tell them what a break that would be, not only with their neighbors, but with the U.S. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Representative Schweiker. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, look, this is fascinating for a lot of us. And one of the interesting things hearing is you're starting to hear now both parties being free trade, which is sort of exciting, um, considering our past history and that's those subjects. Um, I want to also walk through, because my fear is in this discussion, it's much more complex than we're actually touching on. You know, whether the Europeans attempt to be, you know, the right to be forgotten, you know, the right to remove data, to how I move a product in a supply chain back and forth, to digital commerce where what's money? Can I move a cryptocurrency to do a purchase? Can I actually have PayPal? you know, be my mechanisms? Is it, or do I have to touch a SWIFT system that actually has sort of certain bilateral agreements already attached to it to now to one of my personal fixations is data on supply chain. And is it Ms. Pfeffer? Did I get close on the proper pronunciation? Um, you've done some writing about this not too long ago, if I remember correctly. And, um, and am I going the right approach that, that part of our, our issue with Europe is the individual privacy issues, but our issue with certain areas in Asia, it's the control of the money flow and the product supply chain. Um, thank you, thank you, sir. Um, I think our issues are not so crystal clear that we have a variety of issues with Europe. I, the most prominent one at the moment, I believe, is privacy with the GDPR. With Asia, a lot of the issues are similar revolve around the cross-border data flows, as has been brought up many times. And there is a, rel a use more and more by supply chains to use um, 
um, the internet for supply chain tracking, for example, blockchain. Yeah, look, as you know, I have a personal fixation on distributive ledger, um, you know, and um, within that, we've actually had presentations on you could manufacture a product here, you could actually you know, use RFID or types of um, encoded um, uh, containers, padlocks, to make it much more efficient to move through customs, we could, you know, the documentation, so it hits customs, you already have the manifest that completely loads. That, but that's operating at one level, but now I have a problem if there's privacy on my ability to have made the order, to move the money, to, um, was the details in the manufacturing order, was there proprietary information there that doesn't get stolen or handed to the government? Has anyone out there in, in all of your experience um, sort of talked about or written about sort of this unified theory of how we deal with Europeans' privacy concerns, um, parts of Asia's ability to move money, our concerns about moving IP? I mean, if, if we came to you and said, where do we go to sort of find this unified theory? Um, who's written on it? And it's sort of a universal question for everyone on the panel. As to who's written on it, I would probably need to go back and look a little further, but I believe that a lot of the various organizations that focus on privacy issues or on data flows or that represent the industry um, have written on this, but I can get back to you on Mr. that. Mr. Well, I don't appreciate your um, focus through the um, blockchain caucus, and I think these issues are, are critical. I'd say there, I think there are two things. One is the APEC cross-border privacy rules are intend to have a referential that would essentially allow them to be interoperable with uh, EU GDPR. Okay, and so, so you believe that one could actually be sort of the uh, an international standard, WTO, however you're it, it was intended that the two of those should be interoperable and that business should be able to work across because, quite frankly, we're not going to get the EU to stand down on their but privacy. That, but that would be more of a privacy standard for down to the individual level. Well, it around personal information, yes. personally identifiable information, which is replete in what large businesses have. So I think that's an important part of that. Secondly, you know, the role of blockchain technologies, which I think is huge in terms of not only supply chain efficiency, but eliminating corruption uh, in government systems, reducing mm -hmm. leakage. And right now, the rules, because they're so diffuse, don't fully ensure that a country like China couldn't simply block new technologies and require that a domestic. Okay. And I have only, Ryan, um, oh, sorry, I, I really liked parts of your testimony and um, you, you hit some really brilliant things, but um, is there any platform, because you know we were also excited a few years ago, the ability to use internet and public information to deal with everything from bakshish, I mean corruption, to in, in societies, and I know certain local governments have pushed back on that. At the same time, you and I are trying to build sort of the eBay of the world. Where do I go to try to find a way to continue to push open commerce? And I, I, I think that's, that's being explored by a lot of scholars, including the use of the distributed ledger. Uh, I'd be happy to follow up on, on projects that are underway on, um, in that regard. If we get a second round, I'd love to talk to you about um, is a worldwide sort of node network one of the solutions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and Dr. Adams, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all very much for your testimony. Uh, I agree with the idea that the U.S. must lend, uh, lead on the issue of digital trade as it provides the foundation upon which the world economy of the 21st century will be built. But I want to emphasize that we focus um, on not repeating the same mistakes we made in past trade agreements uh, like NAFTA, which really impacted my state, which eroded the wages of middle class workers and small business owners. Uh, we need to ensure that the benefits that flow from our future trade agreements are shared equally among all market participants. Uh, Ambassador Holiman, uh, you mentioned in your testimony the trade barriers that foreign nations are enacting in terms of, of new regulatory regimes and rules in the digital space. So my question is, how can Congress break through these barriers in a way that ensures uh, U.S. business and, and workers are able to play on, on a level playing field, uh, uh, thus ensuring that benefits flow to, to all. Thank you, Dr. Adams. I appreciate your question. Um, there are two things I would suggest. One is by 
using your power in Congress to make sure that these issues are top of mind and top of attention for the U.S. government. It's not only by having hearings like this, having the good work of CRS. I highly commend these International Trade Commission reports. In fact, there are two that will be coming out that are actually going to be confidential. Um, Ambassador Lighthizer will uh, determine whether any of that is made available, but I would encourage this committee, when that is, the next two are made available, to have a classified hearing and ask the ITC, because they were really trying to dig into this to help this committee and the negotiators understand where to focus their efforts. Secondly, I think we have to more broadly bring the benefits of a global trade to our citizens, and I think that's improving things in our local community, but I also think it's fighting among like-minded economies and countries for provisions like the Digital Two Dozen that were in the TPP and that are similar in NAFTA, allying with our partners and moving ahead on those, because until we get new rules in place, then we don't have an effective counterbalance against the economies that want to close. So simply having them on paper isn't good enough. We have to get them in place and get other countries to make the commitments. Thank and you, Dr. Adams. To, to follow up on that, what impact would a prioritization of uh, rural broadband have on closing this divide? Well, rural broadband is a key part of it to, one, make sure that every citizen in the U.S. economy can build not only their domestic and national and their local engagement, but for those individual entrepreneurs and creators who want to have markets outside of their local community, outside of this country, these are the rules that we need to do it. That's why President Obama, Ambassador Frogram, we believe so strongly in these digital two dozen provisions, because we believe that added to better broadband in the United States, it would create a more equal playing field for all types of American citizens in the fastest growing global markets. Thank you. I'm concerned uh, um, uh, by the FCC's repeal of net neutrality, uh, allowing inter internet providers to charge more for certain content or give preferential treatment to certain websites. So what kind of Im impact could the FCC's action have on ensuring free digital trade? Well, it, it's, it's, it's a model that get, will get picked up by other countries. Uh, that could increase the disparities in what it costs for people to use the internet. Um, generally, in the trade arena, we were trying to find ways to break down barriers. And we believe, again, it's not a technology issue. It's an issue for all economy. And we believe that citizens at every level needed to be able to access. So, so it's what we were driving in the digital two dozen. Thank you. Ms. Pfeiffer, uh, uh, you uh, stated that China has been persistent in stealing intellectual property. What are better alternatives for the U.S. to pursue uh, to combat this practice in a digital trade regime? Um, to, uh, for, in order to deal with China, we have multiple, we have various bilateral um, communication forms that we use with them. It's also an opportunity for the United States to engage with its allies. Um, such as the EU and Japan and others who have con concerns with the China's re um, internet sovereignty regime in terms of their cybersecurity law and others to pressure China to make some changes on it. There's, I know Congress is working currently on the CFIUS re reform is working its way through Congress there are multiple op opportunities for engagement with China to explain how that their, their rules can also have a negative impact on domestic Chinese companies in addition to U.S. Thank you, Thank US you very companies. much. I'm, I'm out of time. So Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Representative Hanel, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for being here. I wanted to stay on the topic of China and the Internet sovereignty issue, and Mr. Heather, I wondered if you had any additional insights or comments on that topic, and same for Mr. Radia. No, I would agree with uh, what was previously stated, that you know, China's approach uh, to uh, sovereignty of the Internet is one that uh, is counter to the way in which we look at uh, the internet and its role, not only for digital trade, but for speech. Um, in terms of kind of bridging the question that was previously uh, asked, I, I would totally agree that the only way to approach China is with our partners around the world. 
Um, there is uh, no easy fix uh, to our uh, trade problems that we have uh, with the Chinese, but if we don't have partners in those conversations, uh, the job is much tougher. Got it. Mr. Rudia, anything to add? I, I would agree with what, what Mr. Heather said and, and echo that the Chinese approach to uh, intellectual property, the censorship of the Internet, among other areas, is, is very problematic, which, which raises a difficult question in some cases for U.S. Internet companies as to whether to engage with China or not in terms of being located in the country and doing business there. I don't think there's a clear answer to that question universally, uh, because in some cases engaging and abiding by uh, problematic censorship rules is, is a better approach, although some, some Internet companies have decided that they would rather not operate in the country, although users in China can sometimes access uh, their services by circumventing the Great Firewall of China. Okay, thank you. In the 6th District of Georgia that I represent, we have a fairly significant footprint of Chinese companies based in uh, the district. So, you know, I just wonder, ultimately, with that approach, it's going to eventually come back around and be detrimental to their own companies as well as being detrimental to the U.S. Um, we're live streaming this, and I, it struck me as I was listening to um, all of the testimony that we might have some viewers and individuals who are newer to this issue like I am. And I would be curious to understand sort of the process because the GDPR was a long time in the making and sort of how we got to this place and what was the role of the United States in those negotiations um, and did we weigh in and were our concerns um, voiced? Were they taken into consideration? And um, perhaps, um, Mr. Heather, you can weigh in and Ambassador Holliman. Uh, it was a long road to get where we are today. Uh, in short, uh, the previous uh, legal framework was developed in 1995, I believe, uh, within the EU. Uh, they embarked on an effort to update that. Uh, and somewhere along the way, uh, Edward Snowden and revelations associated with NSA uh, came about and put uh, an accelerant uh, into the mix uh, that uh, really limited the ability for uh, the United States government or the U.S. business community, for that matter, to uh, engage uh, in a way that we might otherwise uh, have been more productive in, in steering. So uh, there was a, a bit of a, a, a storm of uh, un unseen events mm -hmm. that occurred that uh, really limited the ability to have effective influence. Ambassador? I agree with everything that uh, Mr. Heather said. Um, I mean, the world sort of changed very much uh, after the Snowden uh, leaks in terms of um, other countries basically not trusting the United States. Uh, what I think we have is two opportunities. Uh, you know, and we did engage, um, certainly, on the GDPR. It was clear that something was going to happen. Uh, I think we have two, two options. You know, one is to find these ways that we can be interoperable, which, again, is to drive the APEC framework. Mm -hmm. And the challenge that the U.S. has, quite frankly, is that we don't have a uniform privacy law in the United States. Congress has grappled with this for many years. We have a series of laws that protect health data, other data. And so when you stand that up, quite frankly, against a comprehensive privacy law, it has been through multiple administrations difficult to say, adopt the U.S. approach with a series of different laws. And so the more comprehensive approach of the GDPR is the one that's gaining authority. So I think as Congress looks ahead, you know, it's been debated, you may want to continue to think, is there a comprehensive framework for the U.S.? And then make sure where we are a player like APEC that those end up being truly interoperable and bringing that up to the EU, that we need to make sure that those are interoperable. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And uh, Senator Klobuchar, I recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to all of you. Um, this is such an important topic, digital trade, with 95 percent of our potential customers outside of our borders. And I have seen from small businesses in our state that this is the way that they actually get to engage in export that they might not have done otherwise uh, before we had digital trade. Uh, in our state, exports uh, were over $20 billion in 2017, and manufacturing accounted for $19 billion of those exports. So uh, starting with one thing that's not manufacturing, and that's tourism. I'm the co-chair of the Senate Travel and Tourism Caucus, and we've been doing with Brand USA a lot of advertising digitally of our country. And Mr. Heather, um, can you talk about how digital trade can benefit the U.S. tourism industry in general? 
Well, I don't think anybody books a, a flight uh, or uh, an adventure without using uh, the Internet these days. Uh, so, uh, as I said in my testimony, uh, most of what happens in services uh, trade is now uh, available because of, uh, of the Internet. And uh, we have barely tapped the ability to export our services. In my opening testimony, I, I said that only 3% uh, of all of our services output is exported. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more that we can uh, facilitate the movement of data across borders, the more that we can have an open Internet system where uh, tourists from outside the United States can see uh, what destinations they can visit in the great state of Minnesota, uh, the better chance there is for, for there to be uh, tourism in your great state. Exactly. And international tourists spend an average of $4,400 every time <clears throat> they come to our country. So it is more than just the airline business. It is more than the hotel business. It is retail and everything with it. Uh, reliable data, Senator Capito and I just passed our bill out of the Commerce Committee this morning on getting better measurements for economic impact of broadband along with uh, Senator Sullivan. And what we're seeing now is if we don't have that broadband deployed in rural areas, um, we're not even going to be able to use the equipment that we have or that other parts of the world are using that have better internet in places like Canada or even Iceland. Um, so could you talk about the importance of that with our modern-day machinery and technology? Well, certainly the ability for uh, any American to access uh, the modern economy requires access to the Internet, and uh, innovation doesn't only happen in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so the ability to bring real broadband uh, across America so that uh, Americans, wherever they are, uh, have the ability to be entrepreneurs and start up a business and, and not only reach uh, other consumers across the U.S., but to those 95 percent of consumers that exist outside the United States is an opportunity to, to export. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, over the last few years, online companies, as you know, um, have uh, had some major issues with the disclosure of personal information. And while we know that there's this great advantage of using the internet to improve our economy, we have some of the world's best companies that have developed these products. Coming with it are some issues, and one of them is this uh, data being disclosed. And Senator Kennedy and I have introduced a bill that is basically a consumer rights bill to improve consumers protections on online data. As you know, other countries around the world have done this to some success, to some not. Uh, but this idea that we have no rules in place at all, while we see this increase in digital trade and digital business, I think is a real problem. And even Mark Zuckerberg at our hearing um, um, told me, he thought uh, publicly, that we were probably going to have to have some legislation come through Congress. One of the provisions of our bill he agreed to is a 72-hour limit on notice when a consumer finds out that their data has been breached. Um, could you talk about uh, the importance of allowing consumers, as part of this move to greater digital trade, uh, to allow them to have greater control of their personal data? Senator Klobuchar, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think the focus on what consumers need and ensuring that there's right privacy protection and the right tools to address when there are breaches is, is critical. I mean, trust in the Internet is critical. Uh, what we do globally around our trade frameworks, like the Digital Two Dozen, they require countries to have privacy frameworks in place. They don't say exactly what they need to be. There's probably not one size fits all, but quite frankly, the U.S. should lead on this. Um, <laughs> well, that's we, not been happening. When, when, and when we talk on digital trade and transfers of data, we also need to be simultaneously saying, and we want to do that in a way that protects personal privacy. So it's not one or the other, transfer data or protect privacy. It should be both, and we should be bold in how we talk about both. So thank you for your question. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative LaHood, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome uh, our witnesses here today. Nice to have a fellow Illinoisan on our panel. Mr. Heather, welcome. Um, I want to focus first on um, China and um, cloud services and access. And as I look at the barriers and hurdles and restrictions that the Chinese have put in place with cloud in particular, and whether it's Amazon or Google or Facebook, um, trying to wrap my arms around how we remedy this situation. If you look at Alibaba, you look at their access in the United States, and, and when you hear the stories of companies that go to China and try to engage in cloud, and really the extortion uh, or, or fill in your adjective on what you want to use in terms of what they put in place in, in, in terms of that. You know, it's, 
trying to figure out um, what is the remedy for that? What should we be doing? Uh, you know, trying to work within the framework of international norms on this, but it is extremely frustrating to have that, uh, again, those barriers in place there. Uh, Ambassador, if you could comment on that. Mr. Lud, you, you state the problem precisely, and the consequences of what China is doing can't be overstated. I mean, essentially, they are taking an ability to access their market. They are limiting the amount of access by foreign players. Everything is moving to the cloud, as the CRS report and ITC report. And if we don't have full access to the market, that will be a long-term hindrance to our companies doing glo working globally. So we were trying to negotiate in the Obama administration a bilateral investment treaty with China. One of the things we made absolutely clear was that to ever have an agreement with the U.S., we had to have openness in areas like cloud computing. So we need to pursue this at every, 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 at every course. Secondly, we need, we need allies in this effort. I mean, the TPP partners agree with us on this. They don't want to see Chinese companies hold this, and so we need to tackle it bilaterally, but quite frankly, we need friends. And this is an area where there should be friends because my concern is this. One is that China is the largest market in the world. It will remain the largest market. If Chinese companies, many of whom have fine products like an Alibaba, if they have a protected market in China and then can access the rest of the world, U.S. companies can access the rest of the world but not China, then that is not only distortive to the economy but in areas like data analytics, um, AI, where you need information for non-Chinese companies to essentially have none of that information is not only economically harmful, but it decreases their efficiency long term. And that's why the barrier is bad today and is getting worse over time. Thank you for that. We could, we could talk on and on about that. I, I do want to switch to, switch to another, another topic here, um, just broadly on trade. And, and Mr. Heather, I'll ask you this. Um, you, you know, I look at kind of this, what I would describe protectionist path that this administration is headed down, whether you look at uh, TPP, whether you look at NAFTA, whether you look at steel and aluminum, and particularly in the NAFTA negotiations, I, 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 I look at the collateral damage that will be done to digital trade and other things by what I would call unconventional and unorthodox positions that we have taken in NAFTA negotiations. Look at ISDS, look at sunset provision, look at rules of origin. You know, these are, um, I think, hurdles, barriers that are really, really hard to get our partners uh, to, to agree upon. Um, can you comment on that, on, on whether you're optimistic uh, with the approach we've taken that we're going to reach a resolution on this? Well, first of all, it's good to see you. Uh, probably don't remember, but 21 years ago, I worked for Lolita Didrikson, uh, and we met uh, in that capacity. Uh, I was yep. senator then and uh, had uh, more hair. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's good to see you. I, I think you uh, have, have uh, painted the problem uh, accurately. Um, if we're going to confront China, we need partners. And the activity that this administration uh, and the agenda this administration has pursued has kind of poked the eyes of all the partners that we need to be aligned with us in conversations with China. And uh, from that standpoint, uh, at least in the immediate near future, uh, I don't have a lot of hope for having a dialogue with China that will involve the EU, will involve Japan, will involve uh, Canada, will involve the former uh, collection of TPP countries that we used to be aligned with uh, in having a whole of uh, country approach, uh, global approach uh, to, to addressing uh, the concerns uh, with China. Uh, at some point, I suspect that will change, uh, but at least in the short term, uh, the, the actions that this administration have taken have not created an environment for us to find partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here. Um, I think you could see from the engagement on both sides of the aisle, there's a recognition that there's potential, huge potential and opportunity for where the United States can go and should go and needs to go. Uh, in this space, and so I think your comments uh, across the board have reinforced that, and we have some suggestions to follow up on now, actually, and continue to drive attention to this. So with that, uh, I want to remind members that should they wish to submit questions for the record, the hearing record will remain open for five business days, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.